All right, well, um, this next question was a little cumbersome, so bear with me as we explore through it. I think it's a useful question. I just think that we have to be very careful of how we apply uh, the methods here, namely how superposition applies at different points. So uh, let's just dive in, and I'll highlight things as we go along. So a rotating electric dipole can be thought of as a superposition of two oscillating dipoles, one along the x-axis and the other along the y-axis, with the latter out of phase by 90 degrees. That makes sense. One's on the x, one's on the y. So the dipole moment P is equal to P naught cosine omega t x hat plus sine omega t y hat. Using the principle of superposition, equations 11.18 and 11.19 find the fields of a rotating dipole. Also, find the pointing vector and the intensity of the radiation. Sketch the intensity profile as a function of the polar angle theta and calculate the total power radiated. Does this answer seem reasonable? Okay, let's see. Let's at least look at what they're talking about here. So if we have some dipole moment P that's in the XY plane, that's rotating in a circular motion, um, you know, again, we're, to we're told that this is oscillating, right? Or rotating electric dipole. And we are trying to consider this as a um, superposition of oscillating dipoles, which is what we started the theory with. Here we see that we just have a circle and plus Q is on one end and diametrically opposed to that is a negative Q on the other end, again, in a circle. So the chord length is the diameter. Okay. And we see that it's moving through some angular measure, omega T. So uh, we just have to be really careful now how we want to approach this problem. Um, before we even get started in that, let's go back to what we uh, talked about with our potentials and fields. This comes down to, um, again, we want only the radiation fields. So we want things that don't die off uh, at, like, for one of our squared relationships that we see in a lot of these fields, they die off too fast. But the one of our relationships we can see go to infinity, and that's the thing we want to have. Um, we want something that's going to carry the radiation, essentially. So we call these the radiation fields. Um, so let's familiarize ourselves with these forms real quick. We have the scalar potential, the vector potential, and both the electric and magnetic fields accordingly. Okay, you see everything has a P dependency or P naught dependency on it and some angular dependency. Okay, so let's start with uh, the superposition principle. We can add the potentials of the two dipoles First, uh, let's express V in the Cartesian coordinates. Um, so, of course, if we know that we're on some sphere or in 3D space, if we're looking for the, um, the radiation at some point outside of the XY plane, then we know that our distance R is going to be X squared, Y squared, Z squared, and the square root. So we can write the V as X, Y, Z, and T for time dependency. Um, here, though, we see that in this case, the cosine goes to the Z and R is, um, well, cosine was Z over R. And then since we're already dividing by R, we get R squared. So that's why you see a Z and the X squared, Y squared, Z squared in the parentheses. But also then we have to tag this along with the sign that we have from the form. Okay. So for an oscillating dipole along the Z axis, uh, for one along the X or Y, we just change Z to X or Y. Okay, so if we're just generalizing this form and reaching out, then we say that uh, based on the construction of these forms, cosine B and the polar angle would hit on the Z axis. So now if we're using superposition, we need to break this down to the X, Y plane, hence the X or Y change. Okay, in, this pr in the present case, uh, what we see is that the dipole moment, which was given to us, is uh, rotating, right? So we're trying to mimic the rotation of this dipole as the superposition of two dipoles. Okay, so we were told that since this is a 90 degrees phase transition, instead of having a co instead of having a cosine sine, we just write it as two cosines. That way we can keep the same base and see that we are a phase shift of 90 degrees or pi over two. So the one along the y-axis is delayed by a phase of pi over 2, or 90 degrees. So if that's the case, 
if we're trying to modify the scalar potential here, we need to take the sine and shift it for the y-axis and shift it by 90 degrees as the requirement for the superposition to work. Okay, but if we do that, the sine from the uh, original form, if we minus the uh, pi over two, that's the same as shifting it to a negative cosine. Thus, what we see here is the application of the superposition where we have some uh, point in space, we get x is the uh, blue coordinate, and again, that is not out of phase by anything, so we just leave this sign there, but the y is out of phase, so we see the negative cosine there instead. Okay, so this is all just taken and abstractifying and modifying accordingly. Um, again, we see we got to be careful with this uh, p naught that we have, and we'll see that come into play later. But I think using the superposition in this manner allows us to see um, what we're dealing with in the xy plane. Uh, again, take your time trying to modify this result because it is not easy per se. Definitely can get messy and we just have to be careful. Um, that being said, once we, uh, once we have this generalized form for the superposition, now we can go ahead and plug in the fact that we're breaking it down into the plane. Okay, so you see how we have the x over x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Let's get rid of that and just put in what we know to be the case, which if we're trying to break the x, if we're trying to get to x, we have to go through the um, polar angle and the azimuthal angle. So for the x over the um, x squared, y squared, z squared, we get a cosine phi sine theta. Similarly, for the uh, y we see in the purple, we get a sine phi and a sine theta. Since both of them have a sine theta, we factor it out. And that's what we see in this reduced form with the curly brackets. Again, uh, this is kind of, you kind of need some insight and some foresight, I would say. But just remember that in dealing with spheres, you have two different angles. And that's where we get the phi's coming into this equation. Now, if we, uh, you know, apply the same kind of methodology, we get the vector potential pretty quickly from the scalar potential. They're pretty intricately related, but now we just have to be careful with the fact that we have an X hat and a Y hat, okay? Um, so, again, all we did was apply the phase shift to that sine, and that's how we got the negative cosine there, and we're good to go. Okay, again, this has nothing to do with the rotating dipole that we see that was given, this has to do with the fact that we are modeling a rotating dipole as a superposition of two dipoles. Okay, that was one of the big weird mental blocks for me. Um, I'm just like, why are we giving this and not using it? But we are using it with the phase factor, so that's the application there. Anyways, as we move on, we see instead of differentiating the potentials to find the fields, let's work with the fields with the superposition, again to save time, we need to modify the given field, so let's observe that the z hat, if we were to write this in uh, spherical chords or spherical uh, unit vectors, cosine theta r hat minus sine theta theta hat. So if we push that through, we see what the sine theta theta hat is with respect to z and r. Okay, the reason why is because cosine was given as z over r, and we can rewrite the field equation. You see we have a sine theta there and the unit vector, so we push the r minus cosine r hat in, and with that, we know that the cosine goes to um, z over r. So we have everything we need as far as the modifications for the electric field. And so now with this modification, we can uh, go ahead and uh, make this do with the superposition principle on the next page. So we see in the bracket there, or the square, we have the, modif we have the superposition of the two fields with the x and uh, x hat, r hat, and the y hat and r hat, but instead of uh, x, we have to replace it with y since it's in the y direction. And we put the sign on there again, uh, use the phase shift that we know. Uh, <laughs> excuse me. B then is just equal to one over C, r hat cross E. And so we just get S is equal to one over mu E cross B, which again, if B is uh, r cross E, then we can just apply back cab and move on or move on our way. Within applying back cab, we see that we have uh, e dot e good to go, and then e dot r. Well, that e dot r cancels out um, once we tidy everything up with the x hat and y hats.
and the R hatch, respectively. Um, so that's kind of nice. But we're left with E squared over mu naught C uh, in the R hat direction. So that pointing vector actually came along quite nice. And by the way, this is something we're going to see kind of systemically throughout the chapter is this way of calculating the pointing vector. So um, I'm too lazy to rewrite uh, that omega with uh, the retarded time. So I just let that be xi, um, yeah, you know, the squiggly sign that we all hate writing. Um, and clearly then we see that the vector A is x hat minus y hat and the vector B is y hat minus uh, whatever component r hat. Again, this is just to save space and typing. So if we square uh, the electric field, that's the same as taking the dot product of itself. So we get all the constants squared, no big deal. But now we have to distribute the dot product with the arguments. So you see we get A squared cosine squared plus 2AB cosine sine plus b squared sine squared. Okay, so a squared is a dot a, which we see is moved on. Again, with the a being a two component vector, we have to distribute. And as you see, we get a one minus uh, r squared, or excuse me, one minus x squared over r squared after we simplify everything. In a similar method, we see that b squared is equal to one minus y squared over r squared. And similarly, once we distribute everything for the a dot b products, we get a uh, negative x, y over r squared, okay? You know, that's not the most terrifying part of everything. We just have to keep proper bookkeeping. But now, if we plug those results into the e squared uh, dot product, we're going to have some time to cancel down things accordingly. Uh, that being said, once we distribute into the parentheses, we get a cosine minus r a minus x squared over r squared cosine and a sine y squared r squared sine but you see that we have a cosine squared and a sine squared of the same argument so they can be canceled down to one thank you pythagorean identity um and then of course we can factor out a one over r squared in both of these or in all three of these terms that are remaining and that's where we get the x squared cosine squared 2xy cosine sine and plus y squared sine squared okay and if you look at that, that just looks like it's a factorable form, which it is. So that's how we get 1 minus 1 over r squared x cosine plus y sine all squared. Okay, but again, remember that x is uh, r, cos r sine theta cosine phi, and y was r sine theta sine phi. Again, we're recalling this because of the fact that we're taking this from the azimuthal angle and the polar angle for some random spherical coordinate. Okay, <clears throat> so if we plug that in, you see both terms have a r squared. Uh, we see that both have an r squared and a sine squared to deal with. And uh, we're left with a um, cosine phi, uh, sine, or cosine phi, cosine z, sine phi, sine z. And we see that we use a sum and difference identity. Again, color coded it as best I could. And uh, you see, once we do that, we are able to, you know, manipulate our way through and reduce that down to something actually quite nice. I like it. Um, that was actually some really cool trickery. Uh, trig functions, of course, always trickery. Uh, but we factor all those things out. Um, and then when we substitute back in for everything, what we see is, uh, again, in red, uh, mu naught, uh, mu squared, or mu naught squared, and it got, goes to mu naught squared over C uh, once we substitute everything back in. Solely for the fact that uh, we had that mu naught, epsilon naught in the um, pointing vector formulation. Yeah, mu naught over C in the pointing vector formulation, so we just canceled a factor there. Um, and then, of course, if we want the power, you know, we have to take the time average of the pointing vector just to give it a sine, a cosine, that kind of junk. So then we take the integral of it. And you see we can integrate over uh, the theta integral or, yeah, the theta integral giving us a uh, uh, two integral to the form with dA. Um, so be careful canceling things. Again, I tried highlighting in red where the radii cancel. The constants come out front. You can split up everything, uh, distribute that sine theta from the dA or, yeah, the dA. And, you know, the d phi integral gives us our 2 pi. Uh, very nice there. Our polar angle theta gives us a 2 minus 1 half times 4 thirds. Um, we've seen both those before, simple calculation.
let it reduce down and you see that we get mu naught p naught squared omega to the fourth six pi c and uh now we're done but uh setting this up as to get rid of the mindset of a rotating and just to apply a superposition with proper modifications it's not too bad in hindsight but going through it i kept messing up the actual point of the question i hope you don't make that mistake but uh yeah this was a mess and i promise you it'll come back again one final note is that if we go and graph the intensity profile, which is what is really interesting with the radiation uh, perspective, we see we get an ellipsoid, um, you know, a football, so to speak, oriented in the Z direction, simply because of the polar angle. Um, I found it really cool uh, because we have the maximum, uh, one, we have, when sine is zero, we get a maximum. So you see that on either end of the Z with respect to the symmetric axis, or which is X and Y plane. But as we get to the X and Y plane where theta is zero, you have a ma you have a minimum for sine, which makes the uh, one minus one half uh, the smallest. So, you know, you can use any number of tools to graph these, but these profiles are what are gonna be used a lot. And the ones in the book are actually really cool. I would try Mathematica first, uh, or Desmos, something like that.